on up. Um, there we go. I think we're good to go now. Let's see if this is going to function properly. I've had a tough time with the computer recently. I think we have operator error this time. It's always no fun when you have operator error. But hey, that's okay. Give me just one second. We will figure this out. I want to thank everyone for being here bright and early, right on time. I am unfortunately behind. Today's Grandpa Day. Grandpa comes on Mondays, and that um, slows us down a little bit because Grandpa gets here a little late. <laughs> All right. Good, good, good. Can anyone grind one, two for a living? I would say anyone can grind two, five for a living. Just depends on how much you want it, how hard you want to work. Um, it's not actually that difficult to beat those games. Um, all you have to do is just play reasonably well, right? Um, also, you have to study a lot. I have a short book called Strategies for Beating Small Stakes Poker Cash Games. If you do everything in that book, you'll be pretty well off. All right. First things first, um, I'm supposed to tell you about giving away money. Yes, we are giving away $1,500 in the form of three World Series of Poker Big 50 seats. You can get information for that at pokercoaching.com slash WSOP. Here is the short book, Strategies for Beating Small Six Poker Cash Games. This is not a complete guide on how to beat poker, but it will give you very good tips for how to beat small stakes cash games. I played a little bit in preparation for writing this book, and I won like at some ridiculous rate. Let me see. Let me see what it was. Thirty-five dollars an hour over. I don't know. I don't know. Twenty, thirty, forty hours, something like that. Obviously, I was probably lucky, but still, the games were great. That was one too. First time catching this live. Welcome, welcome. Good morning to everyone. Can you buy it in UK store slash online? Yes, on Amazon. It is there. You can also go to JonathanLittlePoker.com slash books. All of my Books are available there. Louis Philippe says he grinds one, two a lot and can make a living out of it if he needed to. Yep, that is that is accurate. All right, today we have a question. What are the best traits of a poker pro? That is our topic for today. Traits of a poker pro. First things first, what is a poker pro? Right? That's something that is very difficult to define. A lot of people think making any amount of money makes you a pro. A lot of people think making only $200 an hour or more makes you a pro. You're not live on YouTube. Um, it seems like we're live on YouTube. If anyone's watching on YouTube, type YT or YouTube in the chat. I think we're live on YouTube, but hey, you never know. Um, you finished 28 out of 1,500 people. Good job, good work. All right, so we're going to talk about the traits of a poker pro. I'm going to call a poker pro in this instance for this discussion, someone who wants to make a living from playing poker, okay? That does not mean a recreational player. That does not mean someone who just plays a lot. This means someone who wants to make a full-time living from playing poker. Now, again, that varies from person to person. In the last episode of A Little Coffee, Oh gosh, YT, everyone's here on YT, good. Um, if you are happy making 20 or $30 an hour, which is, there's nothing wrong with that, I think that is certainly considered a poker pro if that is what you're doing to make your income. And understand though that if you have a regular job, you probably should treat people differently, or sorry, people, you should treat poker differently than if you are a... Um, full-time players, right? Because if you have a job, you can always replenish your bankroll. And if you can replenish your bankroll, you have the ability to be way more aggressive, right? Because if you are treating the game as I have treated it, again, I'm not going to give advice for how to be a more degen pro. If you want to treat poker as I have treated it to ensure you succeed, well, you have to be somewhat disciplined. So first things first, what is the main number one trait? Well, for someone looking to have a decent with a decent win rate, what's their next best option? Inner circle or regular poker coaching? Do regular poker coaching. If you want more, get into that. Um, grit. G-R-I-T. You may say, what is grit? Well, it's the premise of a lot of this book. Peak poker performance. I wrote this book with Dr. Trisha Cardner. It is a very, very, very insightful book. And 
teaches you, well, it says right here, how to bring your A game to every session. Grit, in my mind, is essentially the ability to get beat up at the poker table, or in life, and come back equally strong, if not stronger. A lot of people, when they have a bad session, they get down and depressed. I was just looking at a page. It talks about diffusing your negative thoughts. It's one of the, one of the things right here. We discuss the brain. We discuss all sorts of stuff. I think I just saw an image of a brain. Let's see if I can find it. Probably can't now that I need to. Whatever. There are lots and lots, lots, lots of information here. Diffusing your negative thoughts is vitally important. I used to have all sorts of negative thoughts towards poker, towards people, towards things, towards ideas. And that was back when I was a young, dumb kid. There are a lot of people out there who are old, dumb people. And they have negative thoughts towards lots and lots of people. If you are out there and you feel yourself having thoughts towards people of, I don't like this person, so I'm going to try to be rude to them. Or, I don't like poker because I'm losing at the moment or I'm angry at my spouse because I lost an all-in, right? These are ridiculous thoughts, and you must get rid of these thoughts if you want to have any success, success to be a good, high-functioning human, not just a poker player. So you need to have grit, and grit will allow you to continue playing your best, working your best, studying your best, and moving forward productively. Diffusing negative thoughts is definitely not limited to poker. It's completely accurate. You do not need self-defeating thoughts. You do not need negative thoughts, etc., etc. Do we pick a winner for the Big 50? We're doing that in about two weeks at the end of May. I'm sorry, at the end of, end of April. There's a countdown timer if you go to pokercoaching.com slash WSOP. So this book's called Peak Poker Performance. If you want to read more about this, you can get it at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash PPP for Peak Poker Performance. Um things in this book. Create an unbeatable mindset. That's what we're talking about today, right? Pursue excellence during downswings. Eliminate procrastination. Improve your motivation and master your emotions. It's important to master your emotions and be perfectly logical in your approach to poker and life. If you are in there thinking, I'm just going to try to flop well and, and call with the 9-4 also and try to get something good because I think it's going to happen. That is... A problem with your emotions, right? Also, it's on Audible. Yes, you can get this on Audible at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash free. You can get one of my Audible books completely for free if you never signed up for Audible. All right, let's see. Perhaps you should try Prime Mind if you have a mindset issue. That's absolutely true. Go to pokercoaching.com slash primedmind. We're currently running a discount on that. That will help you implement many of the things in this. When's the book uh, Breakfast in Vegas? Um, July 5th at Hash House to Go Go. If you are a poker coaching member, you will be getting an email about that at some point in the future. Let me make sure I write that down and do that. Okay. Last year we had like 40 people there. It's a bit too many. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, who knows what we're going to have this year, but that's fine. I don't mind buying all of you breakfast. All right, so you need grit. You need to be able to get beat up, and you need to be able to work hard and study hard even when things are going poorly. So many people out there, when they see just like anyone even doing better in life than them, they feel like they have to try to drag that person down. And if that's your thought process, well, you're a fish. If you play poker and you get unlucky and you lose and you think, oh, man, I hate poker. This game's no fun. Well, to be fair, maybe that game's not for you, but if you think that you lost because you played poorly or something like that, well, you're a fish. If you play poorly, you always are telling yourself, I'm a great player. I play so well. I never make a bad play. Well, you're a fish, right? And all of these things will make it difficult for you to succeed long term. You have to have a mindset shift. The prime mind deal is a great bargain. Yes, I know. I always try to give you all great bargains. I try to hook you all up because I understand what it's like to come from not having many resources at all. When I first started playing poker, I had $50 to my name. And, no, to be fair, I had more than 50. I had $50 and a $10 an hour job, okay? So, um, and I had like no books, no resources. I, I worked hard at my job making $10 an hour to buy $30 books. And I bought a lot of them, right? We didn't have things like Prime Mind that'll just immediately fix to help your mindset significantly. We didn't have good books like Peak Poker Performance that will actually explain to you the common thoughts that people have and how to fix them. 
So I know what it's like to come from no resources or very limited resources, and I want to make sure that you can get the resources you need at a price that is very valid for you. Um, as far as I know, the offer is still available. I could be wrong. Go to pokercoaching.com slash prime mind and tell me what you see. Um, next. Let's see, on Poker Coaching, do you also try to get the answer to those questions of how I would play or how you would play? Well, I'm presuming the way that I would play is reasonably well. If you get the first or second best answer on the quizzes, you're probably doing okay. Um, let's see. After grit, you need discipline. Discipline. So what does discipline mean? My mom used to tell me when I was playing poker and I would fold for many hands, oh, you're so disciplined. And I don't really view that as discipline. I view that as just being card dead and not being a fish, right? Um, I view discipline more so as doing the thing that you know is right all the time. This can mean all sorts of things, right? Um, for example, let's say you know that you're supposed to keep a very big bankroll. For your tournaments, you're supposed to keep 150 buy-ins. And we're in a situation where, you know, there's a soft tournament, but I only have like 30 buy-ins for it. Let's say you normally play $500 games, and then there's a $3,500 event. The right thing to do is to probably skip the event. And, you know, that's just something you have to do. When you're playing poker at the table, you look down at the 9-4 offsuit or any marginal spot. Say someone raises, you have like 9-7 suited on the button, and you think that you're supposed to, let's say, fold it or 3-bet it. Well, calling is probably not the right option if that's the actual situation for, if that's the actual case in that situation. And you have to have discipline to not do that. So you have to play within your bankroll. You have to play well at the table. You have to have the discipline to prepare your mind and your body for poker, right? If you are out partying all night the day before a major tournament or any tournament, it's probably not ideal, right? So you need to have extreme discipline to treat the game like a professional. Again, we are talking about purely people who want to treat the game like a professional, by the way. We're not talking about people who are playing it purely for fun or for enjoyment or whatever. I get it. If so many people go out to Vegas to have a party, play some poker, and um, blow off steam. That's not the person we're talking to here today. Let's see. Scott Shore, greetings from Birmingham. Hello, hello. My friend Shannon Shore's dad. If you were to pick a piece out of the larger soft, if you were to piece out yourself in a larger soft event, soft event, would that also be a disciplined solution? Yes. Whenever you sell action, you're essentially lowering your buy-in. It's essentially what you're doing, right? So if you're sell, if you're lowering your buy-in, that is fine. You think studying poker exclusively through hand history reviews will lead to success? Mm, no. I mean, listen. If you do anything enough. If it is anywhere near reasonable, it will lead to success if you do it enough. If you only play, and you play enough, it will lead to success. A good example of this are the, um, the poker bots out there that learn purely through playing, right? And like Poker Snowy, for example, I don't think they programmed any sort of actual poker logic into it beyond how to play the game and to try to find the best solution. And it found the best solution just by playing a bazillion hands. The problem is humans don't get to play a bazillion hands. You get to play only five million hands, and that's probably not enough time. It's the last day for the Prime Mind offer. That's what I was thinking, but um, didn't, know, didn't know for sure. By the way, if you're not on my email list, you're missing out. We send out all sorts of discounts, bonuses, etc., etc. For example, on Prime Mind, normally it's $120 a year. We're giving it to you for $30, right? 75% off. Not only that, you also get access to 14 webinars that I did with the authors of Excelling at No Limit Hold'em. So I don't know what more you all want, right? I mean, we have to pay people to, to do this type of stuff. I know people would like things to be completely for free. In my opinion, $30 is pretty close to free. And even, even then, you have to understand, poker coaching material is so incredibly cheap compared to what you're getting in return, especially if you're actually using the information, right? If you pay $100 for something and you use that information to win you, let's say, two more pots each year, if a pot's worth $50, you just paid for yourself, right? Now that's in the first year. What about the second year, third year, fourth year? Now you're just printing money, right? What's my thought on PPP poker? Is it legit? I discuss the major poker sites that operate in America at YouTube. No, no, no. JonathanLittlePoker.com slash USA. And uh, PPP is one of those I think is far from legit. How do you feel about qualifying for tournaments? How do you feel about satelliting? I think it's usually a very bad idea if you care about bankroll management. We discussed this many times. 
Essentially, you're one in six, or one in eight to cash the satellite, then you're one in eight to cash the main event. You're one in 64 to get any money back. And even then, you're probably not gonna win, right? So you're like one in, I don't even know, 600, one in 6,000, whatever it is, depending on how big it is, to actually get a big score. And quite likely, if you're good at satellites, well, marginally good at satellites, you're probably not amazing at tournaments because a lot of people who play mostly satellites are really good at getting in the money. Getting in the money does not pay in tournaments. You have to win the thing. So you have to understand you're playing two very different games. And the other question is, why do you want to spend your time playing a satellite where often return on investments are not very high because your potential win is capped at 10 buy-ins or 20 or whatever it is? Anyway, there are a lot of reasons not to play satellites. We discussed this a lot in the past. Anyway, we discussed a lot of uh, these bankroll questions you all are having at uh, jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. We have the bankroll Bible there. Go check it out. All right. You need grit. You need discipline. One more thing. Well, again, I want to make it clear. Grit is a big topic. It applies to all sorts of things. Discipline is a big topic. It applies to all sorts of things, right? The last thing is um, an interesting one that I think a lot of people don't necessarily consider, but you need to make sure you play well with others. If you do not make yourself an enjoyable person to be around, if you do not help others, if you do not benefit the lives of other people and make their experience enjoyable, you're not going to have access to a good group of friends who want to improve their game, and you're not going to have access to good games. And often private information, right? I mean, for example, the reason I am still here today is be and even became decent at poker is because I played well with others. I found a group of people who were all nice, reasonable people. And that's very, very important to find people like that who are like-minded, who want to improve themselves, and they're not afraid to help out others. So... I think you need to play well with others for that reason. Also, you're going to find that, say there is a big soft tournament, you want to sell action to it. Well, if you don't know anyone or if people hate you, you're not going to be able to sell action, right? So you miss opportunities. Same thing goes for private cash games. If you don't have good connections, you're not going to get in them. Same thing goes for being part of big study groups. Um, I mean, very like for example, I'm a part owner of the Pokar Backing Company because... Well, they like me and think I add value, right? They, they, if I was a jerk and they thought I didn't add value and was not happy to help, they would not have offered me a piece, right? So you need to make sure you play well with others. If you are out there consistently hating on people or causing problems in the community or trying to tear people down, you're going to see all sorts of doors close. And the tough thing about that is you don't even know when the doors are closing because very often... If, um, let's say, I own a company and I'm considering having bringing you in, I'll ask my friends. And if they say, no, this guy's a jerk, well, you know what? You're out, right? And that type of thing is very important because you don't want to see your doors closed. You want to see your doors open. And you want to have as many opportunities as you possibly can. And if you don't play well with others, well, you're not going to have those opportunities. Um, I mean, my best-selling book, I'll show it to you. It is... Excelling at No Limit Holding. This is proof of what playing well with others will get you, right? Notice, all these people, the vast majority of them, told me they have no desire to write a book. They have no desire to do any sort of project like that. But, because I am me, they know I can do the job well, and they know that I will make a good product, they agreed to do it. And if I did not play well with others, this would not have come together. And... It's very important to realize that, that, that if you don't work well with others, you're going to have a very difficult time succeeding long-term because poker is not a solitary game. Uh, let's see what all you are saying. Is it a good idea to play um, satellites at the World Series of Poker and then sell the Lammers? I don't have a problem with that. I mean, listen, I play a lot of the single-table satellites there, and I expect to have like 30-ish or 40% ROI because of the last longer bets you can make there. And the idea is that, yes, you're essentially playing for cash, right? And the neat thing is that if you want your average buy to be like 2 or 3K on tournaments across the board, you can easily do that in satellites. You can also play them much smaller. If you want them to be $200 across the board, you can do that. 
So I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of those because they also don't take a lot of time. The problem with the multi-table satellites is they often take a lot of time, right? They take six hours or eight hours. And you could have played four or five single table satellites in that same time and had a much higher hourly rate. All right, let's see. Is it okay to try to get people on tilt? Depends on what your, um, what your ethics are, essentially. Is it bad poker tap tactics? You don't mean being rude. You mean knowing that someone raises and just call to catch them. Well, listen, if someone is on tilt, then certainly you should go after them and try to take their money. Um, some people use very aggressive tactics to try to get people on tilt. Um, you all saw William Kasuf at the World Series a few years ago, right? He was incredibly malicious towards people in an attempt to get them to go on tilt. And some people have no problem with that. And to be fair, it is, if it's within the rules of the game, there is nothing wrong with it. Just like some people like slow rolling people. Some people don't slow roll people. If it's within the rules of the game, and it is, you should not be offended by it. That said, you do not have to take all the tactics available to you. Because, remember, play well with others, right? If people view you as someone who is unfun to play with and not enjoyable to be around, you're going to see the doors close. And it's not just about making the most money at the table. Because probably the right thing to do at the table is to be a jerk. But poker is not only played at the table. You have to be able to get to the table to start with, right? And without the help of others, that is often going to be a problem. Let's see. You find it hard to push, say, king-10 suited for 10 big blinds in the low jack. Do you push in the situation? Yes. Uh, I actually push wider than the push fold app suggests in small stakes games because people tend to fold too often. When you were younger, you weren't nice to be around. I was probably not all that nice to be around either. Once you realize that you changed your attitude and your life improves. Yeah, because I'm, I'm in the exact same boat. The problem is a lot of people never realize it because they get positive reinforcement from other people who are also negative. It turns out misery likes company. And the company's not good company, but it is company. And for some people, if they go from having no company to any company, they are happy and think they're doing the right thing. They don't understand the benefits of just generally being a good human and bettering the world. I mean, I've made so many mistakes in the past, and once I realized that all of these things were ridiculous and stupid and self-destructive and destructive to others, I stopped, right? And, and worked hard to better everyone's life. Um, let's see. Good morning. Hello. You've been making these morning talks a priority. I'm glad you're enjoying them. How do you play when you're card dead? I have a video on that, how to thrive when card dead. You can find it in the reward section of pokercoaching.com. Basically, you sit there and you try to steal every once in a while. What's my favorite dessert? Cheesecake, although I think that's more like a meal. Let's see. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Let's see. You're not a big fan of slow rolling. Well, no, of course. Um, I don't think you need to do those types of things, and I don't think you should. Do you still think Andy Frankenberger is a clown? <laughs> Every once in a while. I actually played a... Look, Andy and I are, are very good friends now. Andy is a good stand-up human. Um, a while back, this was, gosh, I don't even know, seven or eight years ago now, I posted on Twitter uh, whenever Andy Frankenberger beat me out of every pot playing Ridiculous Hands that I lost to the table clown. And that was out of line, unnecessary. I apologized to him for it. And um, we're good friends. He actually just told me about some pants to buy. <laughs> we, were, we were playing a, a private cash game together because, you know what, we're both generally good for the game you get it you get the doors open and there were two pros in the game myself and andy and that's how it works but no we are good friends um we've taken car rides together to, to poker events we, we've been gone out to dinner he plays some fun hands every once in a while he's certainly gotten better though he actually explained his uh reasoning for his fun play to me in the past that uh he got all of his experience playing in charity poker tournaments and um that's why I played the way he played. Anyway, he's a good guy. Let's see. People slow roll to be jerks. So listen. I don't think it is bad to do anything within the rules of a game. Okay? As long as you are not breaking the rules. There are no rules that say you cannot slow roll. So when someone does slow roll, you should not be offended. If that does offend you, you are probably way too emotional. Understand, when someone does slow roll you, why are they doing that? They're doing that because they think you are weak-minded. 
they think that you will respond poorly and go on tilt. When someone is rude to you verbally at the table, why are they doing that? They're doing that because, well, they probably have emotional issues. And because they are trying to get you riled up, right? So, understand that. What's my opinion on Daniel Grani playing lower buy-in tournaments? I mean, I don't know. He can do whatever he wants. Look, I don't really have much in terms of gossip to give all of you. I try to give facts. I think Negreanu may have some sort of cash bet or something. I don't even know. I don't know what his priorities are. I don't know him. So I, I don't know, right? This is not anything that I have good information on. And whatever. If the guy wants to play bigger, smaller, any, if anyone wants to play bigger or smaller, who cares? All right. A friend of you were at Council Bluffs, ran your situation six-handed. You had a one-hour dinner break. All right. Your friend said his character would not allow him to steal people's big blinds because they weren't there to defend themselves. You said that is a leak. Um, is it within the rules to steal the blinds? Yes. So you want to allow your character to detract from something like that. And again, like, is a char does character make you not slow roll? Does character make you not belittle people? Does character make you not be incredibly rude? And yes, it does. The thing is, though, I don't actually think that being incredibly rude and belittling people and slow rolling people actually gives you all that much value. That just makes them hate you. And again, poker's not only played it on the felt. But um, yeah, if the guy's not there, you should steal their blinds because they would steal yours. I know this is not great logic. This comes up in Heads Up, Sit and Goes Online, by the way. Um, if someone, if you're playing against someone and they disconnect, should you blind them out? And Olivia Bousquet, one of the authors of this book, one of the regulars, he was the king of the Heads Up, Sit and Goes for a long time, essentially said that you should not blind them out. And I was kind of surprised at that. And he said, just because someone would do it to you does not mean you should do it to them. But essentially... It's not the right thing to do. So you don't do it. So you give a little bit of equity in exchange for being a better person. So it's a tough thing, right? You have a very hard time hearing me. Turn up the volume. You may have a hard time hearing me. Look, I have the microphone over here so you all see me. You want, you want me to be like the people on Twitch and do like this? Hello, hello, hello. You can probably hear me better now. But I'm um, sorry, we're not doing that. Turn it up. I know the audio is not the best. We do have the best microphone. Not the best. But a pretty good microphone. So that's it. Are you still uploading weekly poker hands? Yes. The last video wasn't in there. Ooh. Well, I will make sure that's... I actually don't upload those. I have someone else upload those for me, so I will make sure that those are there. Um, what's my opinion on betting into dry pots when someone is all in in a tournament? Sure. If you think you're gonna never win more than the current pot, you probably shouldn't. But whenever you bet and your opponent folds, you clean up equity. Cleaning up equity is very important. Um, what were we talking about? Negron says he's going for the player of the year, so he's gonna play all the tournaments, even the smaller ones. Sure, right? I mean, if you wanna to try to get player of the year, try to get player of the year. Yeah, Patrick, Matt Affleck did have bad sound in his quizzes initially, but you know what I did? I bought him one of these and mailed it to him, and now his sound is way, way better. His first, first ones were not very good, though. I learned a long time ago, if you want people to have good audio, buy them the microphone. <laughs> buy them the nice microphone and mail it to them, and they'll use it. Um, Peter says, be kind and respectful. Have a good mindset and study away from the table, and it will benefit you in the long run. That is absolutely true. If you are generally negative, understand it does not have to be that way. I used to be such a negative person. And I don't know why. I don't know why. Like, my parents are not negative people. My, I was not raised to be a negative person, but somehow I got sad and disgruntled. And I don't know why that happened or where that happened. Maybe, it's, maybe it would have happened no matter what. But somehow I came out of it. The problem is I don't really know how I came out of it. And that, that's the tough thing because it's, it's difficult to say what I did or what happened. And... I don't know what happened. And the change, I think, I mean, it came before I started winning at poker tournaments, which is very important to realize. A lot of people think, oh, you started winning, so you got happy. But that's not it. I, I was happy before, before these things happened. And I think it's just coming to the realization that you really do get to pick your attitude. You get to pick your view in life. Unless, of course, you have some actual mental problem, right? I'm, not, I'm talking about most reasonable people. If you have a mental disease and that's very different, if you have that, go talk to a psychiatrist or psychologist. 
a professional, not me. <laughs> um, but if you are a normal human, you do get to pick how you view the world. The, your perception is vitally important. For example, if you lose a poker tournament, you have many reactions that are possible, right? You could be angry at the opponent. You could be angry at the dealer. You could be angry at yourself. You could be angry at the casino. You could um, take all the money in your net worth and go play roulette and try to spin it up. You could go home, have some tea, and read a book. Go home, have some tea, and study poker, right? And go home and watch TV. And go home and get drunk and pass out. You have many, many, many choices. And if you do not have grit, one of the most important things, if not the most important, you will make bad decisions and that will drag you down long term. I mean, just think about it, right? What if I went home and studied one hour of poker every day after I busted and I compare that to someone who goes and um, gambles in the pit and gets drunk every day after they play poker? Well, after 10 years of that, I'm going to be pretty decent at poker. They're going to be probably broke and not in good shape and maybe have liver disease. I don't know. And you have to understand that you get to make your choices. And if you pick the proactive good one, that's going to make you way better long-term than if you pick the destructive one. Um, being mad at the dealer is pretty ridiculous and weak-minded. Being mad at anyone besides yourself <laughs> is pretty ridiculous and weak-minded in my opinion. Don't be mad at your opponents. Don't be mad at the casino. Don't be mad at the dealer. Be mad at yourself. You're the one who decided to go play the tournament. You knew when you signed up, that losing is a possible outcome. And that's that. If someone slights you, realize it's not personal. Quite often, they just have problems in their life and they're trying to take it out in some way. Maybe I got happy after I met Amy. I met Amy after I won all the poker. <laughs> I guess I got happy maybe 12-ish years ago. 12 or 13 years ago. Let's see... Do you ever chop single table sit and goes? Yes, absolutely. Not evenly. <laughs> I definitely don't evenly. Um, I usually chop with them giving me an edge. If they don't give me an edge, I do not do it. You, you're a very educated person. I don't know if I'm that educated. I didn't graduate college. I'm a, I have studied a lot, so maybe, maybe that's the case. You know something that's helped me a lot is listening to podcasts by people who are positive go-getters who work hard to better the world. And I think that that's pretty important. The only opponent is the one in the mirror. That is absolutely true. Completely agree. Can we talk about Omaha cash games? You can talk about whatever you want. I don't know if I'm going to talk about it, but you can talk about it. <laughs> Tommy Angelo's book is a great one on the subject. Do I have that over here? Mm, I don't. I, I liked his, his first book a lot called Elements of Poker. There's a lot to be learned from that one. <clears throat> he has a few other books. I have not read them all. But Elements of Poker is a very good one that I would definitely suggest. Just like a lot of tips, like mindset tips. Kind of like um, the Tao, Tao of Poker, T-A-O. Tao, Tao, or maybe Ameri English. Dumb Americans or um, not dumb Americans, you get to pick. But um, that's a good one too. Not exactly great playing of poker advice, but very good mindset advice. Example, like, yeah, Tim Ferriss is a good one who I like. I like a guy named Pat Flynn. I've learned a lot from him. All of this, by the way, is because of Pat Flynn and a guy, Gary Vanderchuk. Two people. I've learned a lot from both of them. And essentially, get out there, do good work, be a positive influence on people, and they will reward you. And I thank all of you for rewarding me for all of my hard work, and I fully plan on continuing forward, right? Also, you need to like what you do. If you don't like what you do, if you don't like playing poker, if you just don't like it, well, find something else, right? You don't need things you don't actually enjoy in your life. And no one says you have to enjoy poker, right? And, it, I mean, like, some people like other games, right? Maybe you like playing basketball way more than you like playing poker. Well, try basketball. Now, you may not be able to be a good basketball player, but most of you and most people are not winning significant money at poker, right? So if it is essentially a hobby Understand that it is a hobby, and hobbies are supposed to be fun and enjoyable. Should you memorize opening ranges or have some idea of what they are? Um, I don't think you need to be 100% perfect, but definitely you should have a very clear idea of what hands you should be raising in each position. You have two buy-ins to the Sunday Million. What do you do before and after? Wait. 
do you want to do a before and after Jonathan Little coaching challenge? I'm not sure what you're even saying. Um, I suggest you learn as much as you can before you play. When you go play a tournament, you consider it already lost. That helps you play your game and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of mental tricks you can use. I just realize that you don't have much control over the outcome. All of your study and work ahead of time will dictate how you play in the game. A lot of people... This may be a controversial idea, but I think a lot of people think they actually get to make a lot of decisions when they play poker. I don't think you do. I think your decisions are made well before you show up by your study and your work away from the table. If you thoroughly understand the game, you understand your opponents, or understand the opponents you are likely to encounter, your decisions are already made, right? And if your decisions are already made, then, then that's it. That said, if you don't know what you're doing, then yeah, you make decisions, but the fact that you don't know what you're doing was your decision. All right, let's see. Explain to you the moment you quit being upset at the jackass at the table who blindly gambles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I don't understand why you'd be mad at your opponent for playing poorly. When people play poorly, you win. You win equity when people play poorly. Understand your goal is to win equity, not to win dollars. Your goal is to win equity. And when people play poorly, you win equity. Do you like Jerry Tendler's book, A Mental Game of Poker? I do. Jerry Tendler actually wrote a book, or wrote a chapter. Uh, he's written, I think, two books. He wrote a chapter. Where is he? There's Jerry Tendler. He was here in Excelling at No Limit Hold'em, going back to playing well with others, right? Jerry Tendler has a great chapter in this book, and his Mental Game of Poker is also a great book. Let's see. You understand it's long-term, but Lord, when it runs for five sessions or more, it falls apart, etc., etc. Five sessions is nothing. Five sessions is nothing. Do it for 100 sessions, and that is when you get a clear idea of if you are actually a good player or a bad player. What's my five-year goal? I do not have a five-year goal. That is something I'm currently considering or pondering. The idea that I don't, I mean, I feel like I am definitely on the right track in what I'm doing, trying to help people become better poker players and better their lives. And I certainly have ideas for things I will be making in the future going forward. For example, I'm going to be making an in-depth cash game course going forward because I'm not happy with the other content out there by anyone else. And I think I will do a good job of that because I have extensive experience in live cash games. So... We'll be making that going forward. But I don't have any sort of five-year goals. I want to be here or there. Um, I mean, I remember a long time ago. I say a long time ago. not even, just, just a few years ago, I, I remember telling myself I would be thrilled if we made a specific amount of money each month. Or in a, any month. Let's say 10K is the number. I would have been thrilled to make 10K in a month. And now we're easily surpassing that. And that's... Um, it's, it's interesting, right? The, the, the way your mind shift changes, mindset changes. And it's important to not necessarily have monetary goals in things because you don't really get to affect them. All you can really determine is the work you do, right? And the environment you choose to work in. Beyond that, it's up to the people you're benefiting. If they, if they find that you are adding value, they'll reward you. If you don't, then, then they won't. All right, let's see. You play with Hoyt Sunday? He said to tell you that he would see it at the World Series. Great. Funny story. Um, I, I posted my... Uh, people I learned a lot from on Twitter a while back. And I wrote a blog post about it. And I mentioned Hoyt Corkings. And a few people said, oh my God, that guy's an absolute scumbag. And then I started asking, like, what do you mean? This guy, he's nothing but nice. He's a stand-up guy, et cetera, et cetera. And then it turns out they were all talking about the same, some other guy who also wears a cowboy hat. It's very important to understand that just because someone wears a cowboy hat does not mean that they are the one shady person in a cowboy hat. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, that, that, that guy's boy. Yeah, that guy's very, very nice. Like, yeah, I know. That's why I listen to him. All right. You've had bad experience with your three to four big one raises getting many callers. Well, what's wrong with that? You, you extract value every time they call you a garbage. Don't forget Anatoly Filatov. I actually kind of got inspired by Anatoly Filatov to do these things. Um, because, hey, I saw him. He was having good success. I figured we might as well, too. All right. Thanks to everyone for the kind words. All the study in the world won't help you if you don't implement what you learn. You're absolutely right. That's the point of Prime Mind. Again, you have one day left to get that at pokercoaching.com slash prime mind. Also, Peak Poker Performance discusses that thoroughly. You can get that at jonathanlillipoker.com slash PPP. If you're playing pot limit games and you get up $500, do you recommend getting up due to variance? Only if you are playing with an incredibly short bankroll. 
Bankroll requirements for Palom and Omaha are huge if you're trying to not go broke. Like four times the size of No Limit Hold'em. So keep that in mind, right? Let's see. Your regular game is a no blind, 25 open, PLO, high game. Is that game beatable? Yeah, just sit there and fold every hand besides ace, ace, blank, blank. You'll crush it. But there are no blinds. The game is as easy as it can be. Super, 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 super easy. Hoyt was very nice to all of you. Yes, I know. No, Hoyt is by far an incredibly nice, incredibly stand-up person, as are all of the people who I listed in that post, the 10 most influential poker players on my life. You shove 16 big blinds on the button after under the gun and limp. You had king nine offsuit. Is that good? Depends on the limper's range, right? Is there an app for Prime Mind? Look, go to pokercoaching.com slash primed mind and you will see the offer we have. It is only an app. It is only an app. Woke up late. Big fan brewing coffee now. Good. Enjoy your coffee. If you had signed up for Prime Mind, Kevin, I don't know, send us an email. Best advice you got for dealing with losing with good hands is just because you have a good starting hand doesn't mean it will automatically win. Stop being an entitled baby. Yes, that sounds like something I've probably told someone. <laughs> um, it's important to realize, when you get aces pre-flop, you're going to win like 80% of the time. That means 20% of the time you're going to lose. That's a lot. So understand what you're doing. Think about it like this, right? Let's say me and you get all in for $1,000. And I have aces, you have not aces. And I'm going to win 80% of the time. What is my profit here, right? If we're putting in $2,000 total and I own 80%, I own $1,600. That means I only profit $600 with my aces. And this is the best possible hand I can have. So if you understand that the best possible situation, getting all in preflop with aces, only gives you 80% of the pot and you put in 50% of it, you're not actually winning all that much money, right? And, I mean, it's a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. If you do it over and over again, you're thrilled. But understand that there is a lot of variance involved. This is the support email, support at pokercoaching.com. It is. Jeff Gross Poker, hello, welcome. Glad you're enjoying the content. I enjoy yours as well. Keep it up. All you can do is keep it up and keep helping people. Mark says, generally surprised, genuinely surprised at how effective Primed Mind is. You use their sleep program every night and you're ready to pass out after five minutes. I was very skeptical of Elliot Rowe. Here's Elliot Rowe, right here. He is the mindset expert behind Primed Mind. He has now, he helped me a lot, right? I introduced him to the rest of the poker world. This was eight or 10 years ago now, maybe six or seven years ago, a while ago. And um, Fedor found him, Fedor Holtz. Fedor Holtz then started winning every tournament. <laughs> he, Elliot Rowe also works with many of the best online players. A lot of the online players, you don't not know this, but they have a lot of problems with staying motivated because it really is a grind playing online every day. And... He's helped them with that. He helped me with the idea of, you know, you're supposed to lose sometimes, right? I, I had some mindset issues before I went to him, and he very much, very he fixed them very, very quickly. And um, Prime Mind will will help you with that. Obviously, it's always better to get like one-on-one -on -one coaching from people, but if you can't, sign up for thirty dollars and get many, many hours of you know slightly more generic coaching. But find what you need, and then use that to better your life. $1,000 bankroll, only option is 1, 3, and 2, 5. Would you suggest playing this or playing online? Depends on if you don't mind losing your 1000 bucks, right? If you don't mind losing your $1,000, then play the 1, 3 game. Don't play 2, 5. Play 1, 3. Realize you're playing very, very shallow. Maybe the actual, actually the play here is to buy in very, very shallow. And then realize you're going to get it all in with 55 or 60% equity over and over and over again. So if you can buy in for 1, 3 for like 30 bucks, sit there, play nitty. Get it all in with a, as a favorite and print your money. Maybe buy in for 60. 60 is probably better. Not the most fun poker, but it'll make you money. Ace Ace XX gets seven callers pre-flop in your game. Good! That means you're just printing all the money. I'm, I'm very happy to hear you found a very soft game, real big pots. That's exactly what you were looking for. Have I turned down any very good offers that I regret today? I don't know necessarily what you mean by offers. Um, one that I, I regret now, I don't even know if it's really a regret. It was a funny, funny instance. I had just cashed in a, I think it was like called the marathon or something like that. The world series of poker. I've been playing five days or four days. I took like 20 something place and got, I don't know, 10 K or something. 
And that day, there was 100K starting. I'd never played 100K yet. And I was walking by one of my friends who crushes poker. He saw me leaving. He said, hey, are you going to play the 100K? I said, no. I'm going to go hang out with my girlfriend, now Amy. He said, you want to play the 100K? I'll put you in. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Talk about a bad mindset, right? To be fair, I think I had not spent any time with Amy because I had been stuck in that silly marathon tournament. But I probably should have played. Then again, I may not have a wife and two great kids if I did that, so maybe that's not actually regret. But I I mean, I, I have learned to say no a lot. You have to understand, as you get more and more offers, more and more, I guess, popular is the right word, I don't know. If you have more and more good contacts, you will get lots of offers. You have to become very good at saying no. And I say no a lot. And I don't regret any of it. I'm trying to think about it. If I said no to anything that's become a huge success, I don't think so. So that's good. But um, no, I don't really regret it. Is it possible to get these webinars posted in your poker coaching section? Uh, Michael sent an email to support at pokercoaching.com. GTO is overrated. Consistently winning players play the player, right? Depends on who you're playing against. If you're playing against very good players, you should almost entirely play GTO. If you're playing against very bad players, you should be maximally exploiting them. I'm a very big fan of learning fundamentally sound strategies and then adjusting those to take advantage of whatever your opponents do wrong. Mark says, you're looking forward to the silly marathon tournament. I call it silly because it just takes forever. It's not a good use of hours, right? Your ROI may be a little bit higher in it. Let's, let's imagine you're normally 30% ROI in a 1500 that takes a day on average. Or your 50% ROI in a 1500 that takes two and a half days on average, right? So in one, you make, what, let's like, call it $500 in a day. The other one, you make $750 in two and a half days. Do the math, right? That's why I call it silly. Um, I, I used to like that idea of I can play the marathon, I'm good to go. But it's just not a good use of time. And now I've realized over the last few years that my most important thing I'm trying to do is maximize time. Because time is very, very limited. Barry Greenstein has a story about selling his Amazon stock before they became the world's biggest retailer, LOL. I mean, we could all have invested in Amazon. We could have all invested in Microsoft. We could have invested in all of these things. We didn't. Right? I don't really view those as regrets or offers or anything like that. Um, like, that's like what I regret of making a poker decision. Like, no, I mean... I wish I didn't play poorly sometimes, but yeah, that's it. Worst deal I missed out on? I mean, again, I like, what do you mean worst deal? I don't even know what that means. You sell the Prime Mind special. Yes, go to pokercoaching.com slash primed mind. Tony Robbins has very good books as well. Does priming exercises daily, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Do I have his books back here? I, I don't think I do, but they're, they're in the other bookshelf. This is the little bookshelf. We have a much bigger bookshelf. Do you ever just play small stakes tournaments with your buddies? I just play small stakes tournaments with my wife's friends. She'll have them over once every, I don't know, two or three months, three or four months, something like that. And, um, yeah, we'll play tiny stakes tournaments. But, no, I don't play with my friends. My friends don't want to play poker for fun because they play lots and lots and lots of poker already. If you looked at life by things you missed, that would be a pretty miserable existence, says Straight Flush. Yeah, I generally agree. I am happy with my decisions. My life is great. And um, that's that. And Kevin, just because something you did would have worked out better does not mean that that was necessarily the right play. Maybe it was. But for all we know, maybe Barry needed the money. Maybe he would have literally gone bankrupt if he did not sell the socks. Maybe he sold them because he was buying and selling all the time, right? We don't know his story. Even if you decided to buy one stock and then sold it, like well, it, it's random. It's essentially random. It is generally well known that the stock market is essentially random. You cannot beat it. Or if you can beat it, it is for a very minimal amount. It's like saying I regret not playing a poker tournament because I would have won this one if I did if I would have played it. Like you can't know that. Alright, let's see. John Doe, I do not believe for this instance. Ace, Ace, X, X, six ways preflop, what are the equity numbers? Go to holdemresourcescalculator.com and type it in. Also, 
real big possible. It's important to understand, when you have ace, ace, x, x, very often you know when you have the nuts. Because the board's going to be ace, x, x, and you're going to win. You're just going to get the money in very, very good. You have to understand real big pots. You're not trying to get it all in with aces preflop. If you're very deep stacked, because you can't get in all, you can't get all, it all in preflop, right? If someone raises, you pot it, and everybody calls. Well, you're not getting it in preflop, so you have to understand that poker is not an all in or fold game. And if it is an all in or fold game, like say you actually are like playing very shallow, and you can just get in with ace ace x x. You're gonna be printing some small amount of equity. I don't know what it is, but it's some small amount. You're de definitely the favorite over each hand, which is gonna make you the favorite overall. Is Amy competent at poker? Not in my opinion. <laughs> she is final table at a charity tournament. The World Poker Tour has one or two very big charity tournaments. They have one in New York City. And um, she final table last year. She was there with my friend David Einhorn. She was there with Eric Seidel. So that was a lot of fun. How would I feel if my kids grew up and wanted to be poker players? I would probably push them in another direction because I think they're going to have many more opportunities than I had. That said, if that's what they want to do with their lives, then sure. How do you, uh, do you think No Limit Hold'em will still be around in 15 years? Yes. I don't know if it'll be the main game, though. It probably will be around. Hi. What are you doing? You want to be a poker player? Yeah. Yeah? You want to be a poker player? Yeah. What's up? This on your face. Yeah. Oh. Can you say, I want to be a poker player? Poker. You, you want to be a poker player? Yeah. This is Mr. James. He's very nice. Oh my goodness. Oh, is it all the babies? That's what we're doing now? Daddy's in charge of all the babies now. Hi. James, do you love Thomas? Can you say hi, Thomas? Can you say hello, everyone? Can you say thank you for being here? How would you feel if they grew up to be poker players? I said, I, I would hope that they have many more opportunities than I did, but if that's what they want to do with their life, then sure. <laughs> Sure. Thomas is growing up to be really, really big. He's very nice, too. He laughs and smiles all the time. Can you smile? Oh, look at these random hands coming in and take the baby. It's so hot with these babies on you. What do you have? What is that? It's a train. That's right. Are you going to go to gym today? Yeah, you're going to go to gym with Grandpa? All right. Go on. Can you say bye-bye? Bye-bye. Can you say, I love you all? Use your words. Don't you say you love me too. All right, bye-bye. Love you. You're a good boy. Go find Grandpa. Bye, see you. No, 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 no. go on. Go on. I got to finish my show. Bye. See, it's so hot when all the kids come in here. All right. He wants to be a police officer. Who knows what he wants to be? He'll figure it out. When you were younger, you dreamed of sitting at a final table with Seidel. You're jealous of Amy. <laughs> Funny enough, I was coaching David Einhorn for that tournament. And um, I'm sorry, for the million dollar buy-in tournament right before that. He busted on the bubble after busting Eric Seidel, okay? He busted Eric Seidel. In the, in the million dollar tournament. They somehow both flew to New York. We flew in like right at the time of the start of this tournament. And um, this is John Sabas event. It's not the CHOP event, but the CHOP event's great too. Um, anyway, we flew in and we, uh, David ended up sitting to the sitting with Eric Seidel again and he busted him again in that tournament. So he busted him twice. Back to back days, once in a high stakes charity tournament, buy-ins like $5,000 or something. And then he also busted him in a million dollar tournament. So that's a lot of fun. Your game is in Westchester. Come through. If, you're, if your game is high stakes and doesn't rake a lot, maybe I'll do it. Do you believe in poker after 10 to 20 years? I'm not sure what you mean by believe in poker. Certainly it's going to exist, right? And if it's not exactly this poker, it would be um, some different form of gambling, right? Um, like for example, daily fantasy sports has come and gone essentially, at least in my opinion, maybe it still exists, but it's basically come and gone. Something else is going to happen. I think sports betting is going to come and go to some extent, um, in terms of beatability, because they're just going to start taxing it. No one's going to win. Um, 
I don't know what's going to be next, right? Before poker, it was rummy and backgammon, and then then poker, and I don't know what the game of choice will be, but there probably will be some game of choice. That said, all the games are getting solved very quickly, so maybe playing games professionally will not be a thing by the time they, they grow up. The neat thing about games, though, is that games like poker are human versus human, and in human versus human games, someone's always going to have an edge. What was my marathon time? I don't... It was, it was 10 minutes per mile. I don't know what, what exactly that means. 26 times 10 is 260 minutes. Do some math. Do I have that thing here? Here are medals from running, running races. Here we have a marathon medal. I did not win. They gave everyone a medal. We have a bunch of half marathon medals. We got this medal for fourth place in the um, single table tournament heads up forum event. Anyway, random medals just stopped up here. So all sorts of stuff back here. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, 10 minute miles. I was not trying to win, I was trying to run, run with my wife and have a good time. Also, I don't like running. I think it's a very, very poor use of time. Unless of course you're learning during that process. I know some people like running and doing things like that to, um, I don't even know, they, they, they like to clear their mind or something like that. I understand that it's sort of meditative for some people, which is fine, look, I have no problem with what people do. For me personally, I did not feel like it was a good utilization of my time. Also, it's generally proven people who run a lot don't live all that long because they, I'm talking like people who run a lot, right? Like if you're a professional marathon runner. And I think the logic is you burn a lot of calories. And when you burn a lot of calories and wear your body out, well, you die a little bit early. And I certainly did not want that in my life. So now when we run, we run hard and fast. And that's it. I do understand certainly that some people love their running though. When I did run, I listened to a lot of podcasts, and I, I think um, that was certainly beneficial. Just having, you know, four-hour runs where you essentially learn the whole time is, is quite nice. All right, let's see. $25 max rake. Yeah, I'm not playing that game. Um, let's see. Why are all books about poker that seem so outdated? I completely disagree. Have you seen my book, Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em? I actually went back and just updated. I'm in the process of updating Secrets of Professional Tournament Poker, Volume 1, 2, and 3. And turns out I had almost everything right. So call it outdated if you'd like, but almost everything was right. There are a few things that were slightly too nitty, but for the most part, it's all right. Let's see... I should come play in Los Angeles. I'm not trying to come play in Los Angeles. I'm trying to stay home with my family. Cycling is better than running, better for your body, etc. I mean, listen, I'm not going to say which, which activity is good or bad. Also, real big pots. Um, if they're raking a lot, $25 a hand is almost certainly not beatable. And that's because in Pot Limit Omaha, equities run close. And if you get it all in over and over and over again, but they're taking out $25 out of each pot, you're just going to get crushed. Um, so no, you, you should not be playing those games if you care about money. Um, the only way you can beat a high-ranked game, essentially, is to play No Limit Hold'em and play a very, very, very tight strategy. I don't know what the rake is at Bay 101. No, call them and ask them, or look it up online. I, it's probably fine, though. All right, I have to go. Instagram's telling me I have one minute left. Make sure you go to pokercoaching.com slash WSOP to try to win the three World Series 500 events. Best traits of a pro. We discuss it in Peak Poker Performance. You can get that at jonathanlittlepoker.com slash PPP. You need to have grit. You need to have discipline. And you need to play well with others. If you do those three things, you have a very good shot. Um, in micro stakes tournaments, what's a good ROI? I don't know. Get in there and try to figure it out. Let's see. All right. Thanks again, everyone, for being here. I hope you have a great, great day. It is Monday. Make the most of your life. All you can do is do better than you did yesterday. So keep it up. Enjoy yourselves. Have fun. Good luck. And I will see you again on...